Um, I hope you're doing well today. Um, it's hard to believe a week has gone by, guys, since I've um, been on here. And today's sermon is called The Ultimate Truth and Reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, I praise you and I welcome you into this place, God. Speak to me, Lord God. Speak through me, Lord God. Let your word, word permeate my mouth like never before. Let freedom reign. Let forgiveness reign. Let love reign in this place today. God, as we meet with you, God, teach us how to be reconciled to you and teach us your truth in the name of Jesus. Amen. I submit myself to you now in the name of Jesus. Help me do this thing right. Amen. Hi guys. Um, this week in on the 30th of September in Canada, for those of you watching in the U.S. and abroad, it was the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. What that basically is, is I, I think uh, from the 60s to the uh, mid-90s, I, I, could, I could have the dates wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it ended in the early 90s. Um, no, in the mid-90s. Um, thousands of indigenous uh, children, First Nations children, were, were taken away from their homes and stripped from their lives and put in residential schools. Uh, which means they they were put in schools to board and ripped away from their parents and ripped away from their culture, ripped away from everything they knew and severely abused and a lot were killed. So on Thursday, um, it was a day of truth and reconciliation and and as I thought about the schools and and what happened, and as I thought about truth and reconciliation, um, I began to think about first of all, uh, uh, through history, how man has treated one another from slavery and the Holocaust, and um, the Japanese Canadians in the war, just how we treated each other so awfully. And I, I began to think about how we kind of, even now, sometimes treat each other horribly. And we just... Um, I begin to think about through history how people have thought because of religion or race or sexual orientation or because of whatever, any difference that, that some people think they have the right to, to treat people differently. And I'm here to say that you don't, even if you don't agree with a person, you do not have the right to treat them differently. Only God can change a person and their views. And you treating a person differently because of any of those things I mentioned or any other things it is totally not permitted in the house of God 
And as I look back on this history, all um all these these people, these indigenous people, these First Nations people, um it was uh predominantly the the Catholic and evangelical churches that were doing this, uh, that were taking these people away from their homes and away from their cultures and stripping them and severely stripping them of their identity and severely abusing them and killing many of them. And it's just, we have a lot to answer for as the church. Um, and when I think of not only the indigenous people, but when I think of um, African American Canadian people, we were stripped of our uh, identity. We were stripped of our uh, culture. We were stripped of our language. We couldn't even read. We it was illegal for us to read or own property. We were consider, considered three-fifths human. Um, and we were sold as livestock, like livestock. And we were treated no worse than, anim no better than animals uh, way back when. And as I look through the history, my thoughts were, God, we really messed up your name, and we, we have done things as the church in God's name that are unspeakable and unthinkable. And now the, these cultures, both the African American uh, Canadian culture and the indigenous culture are still dealing with these, with this, what I've been calling generational trauma. And um, I've come today to say that this is a day of freedom. This is a day of freedom. And uh, I'm calling this sermon the ultimate truth and reconciliation because we know that the ultimate truth in reconciliation comes from God. Uh, he created it. He designed truth and reconciliation and he designed us to be reconciled to him. So uh, to, to Today, you got you guys know I love words, uh, one of the many things I love. So today, I was looking up both truth and reconciliation, and while I get that up, um, just let me get get that up here, and we can continue. My definitions always come from Webster's uh, Dictionary. So, the definition for truth, first of all, is... There are three definitions here. It says, the body of real things, events, and facts, actuality. The, and the second definition is, the state of being the case. That's the second definition. Um, the third definition is really interesting. 
it says often capitalized transcendent funda fundamental or spiritual reality so let me just let me say that again often capitalized a transcendent fundamental or spiritual reality so those are the three definitions of truth so now that we've got truth down um let's go to reconciliation or reconcile And to reconcile, the root word of reconciliation is reconcile. So, to reconcile is to restore friendship or harmony. So, so basically, this week, Canada acknowledged the atrocities done to these children at these residential schools. And, um, I think it's a really wonderful thing that Canada is acknowledging, um, what happened to these children. Because when, when somebody acknowledges it, that means they can they can't change the past but moving forward we can be aware of what happens and making sure that it will never happen again and throughout history um there like i said from slavery to the holocaust to um the apartheid to um all these all these genocides and all these killing that other um people have experienced uh throughout history uh there's been um a lack of acknowledgement and the fact that canada acknowledged that this evil was done to these children most of them didn't even return home and those who did were severely traumatized was really excellent and I applaud Canada for doing that um, and also um, I came to talk today about the ultimate truth and reconciliation as I thought about uh, what this day really meant um, to um, my country I thought about it on a deeper level um, I thought of when Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life so if the Lord said he is the truth And truth is about facts. It means he holds the ultimate level of truth. There is no truth aside from him. He is the fundamental 
the key holds the fundamental elements of facts, and there is no truth aside from him. He created truths. He is the truth. He cannot lie. And there, there is something in all of us who want that wants to accept the truth, and there is something in all of us who wants to deny the truth. And he he says today, I am the truth. I I need you to accept me. I need you to stop running from me. And that is so that is so interesting. He said there are there are several people in churches today that are running from the tr- that are running from the truth. Not that they're not that they're running from church. They're just they're in church, but they're running from God and His truth, or an aspect of their lives. Uh, are running from the truth like you may accept that god exists but you may be you may be living in a way that he doesn't want you to live or you may be a totally um angry person or a person who likes to gossip or whatever and the truth and you may be running from that truth And in all our lives, there is a truth that we are running from. I was talking to a friend the other day, and I said something to her. I said, there is a part in the Bible. I said to her, I can't judge anyone because there is a verse in the Bible that will bring me to my knees because I'm not there yet. And the Lord's word is true. It is true. Um, But we have to understand, although it is true, sometimes truth is a process. But the first step to ultimate truth is acknowledgement. Just like Canada did this week uh, with the uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, they acknowledged the truth. They acknowledged that, yes, this happened. Yes, we, this was wrong. Yes, um, we can't let this happen. And they might not be able... They, they are not able to do, uh, excuse me, they are not able to do anything about the people who have died, but at least the acknowledgement of saying, yes, this happened, it's a start. And there are some truths that, that, um, you're not experiencing because you're not acknowledging that you need help in this area. You're pretending that things are fine and you're trying to run uh, from God although you're sitting in a crowd. And I'm not even talking about uh, people who don't know the Lord. I'm talking today Um, to people who know the Lord and are sitting in in the crowd and lifting their hands, but yet they're still running from a truth that God is trying uh, to minister to you, a truth of his love, a truth that you're good enough, or another truth that can be a specific truth, that he's been trying to minister to you, but you've been too stubborn to actually take on. He's saying, I need you to stop running and face the truth. Until you acknowledge 
the truth, which is my truth, your situation will not change. Your situation, whatever it is, will not change without acknowledgement. And after you acknowledge the situation needs to change and reach out for help either uh, to God himself or to a friend or to an organization, you will still remain bound. And God's ultimate concern always is your freedom. And the truth is the first step to freedom. Tr truth is the first step to freedom. And after you acknowledge the truth, you can be reconciled. There can be harmony in the situation. There can be a putting to things right in the situation. Uh, after you acknowledge the truth, it won't go away right away, but it, and like I said before, truth is a process, but the first step to freedom is acknowledging that you have, that there is a problem. This is the problem. Running from your past or the truth that God is trying to show you is not going to make your problem go away. Your problem will just follow you. And the Lord, the ultimate truth and reconciliation is God's. God's God wants you to live out his truth and to be reconciled to him to be reconciled to his grace, to be reconciled to his love. He wants that for you ultimately more than anything. And he wants me to say that his love will cover every sin. All he needs is your acknowledgement of your mistake. Like, there's no need to be ashamed. There's no need to walk in guilt. All of those are um, serpent nature things. They're not God nature things. Let me let me explain what that means. When Eve sinned, uh, she was tempted by the serpent, and she uh, gave in to temptation. So, in my mind, we have two natures in us. Uh, a serpent nature and a God nature. The serpent nature in us likes, ev like, likes the evil things. We like the, the serpent nature in us likes the evil things. We like lust. We like to lie, we like to steal, we like to cheat, we like to um, do all that. That's our serpent nature. Our God nature likes light, likes goodness and truth and kindness and gentleness and, and the fruits of the spirit. And our serpent nature is constantly battling with our God nature. Um, because when Eve ate the fruit, she didn't only have her eyes open to e evil. I think she adopted um, the serpent nature as well as, but being created in the Im image of God, she still had her God nature, and up until now, we are still battling um, our, between our sin nature and our God nature. When Paul says, the things I do, 
I don't want to do and the things I want to do I don't do. That's the battle between the sin nature and the God nature. Um, God wants to lessen that battle today by bringing his truth to your circumstance. Stop running and deal with what's there. He wants the best for you, but you keep running from what you need to deal with. He's saying, stop it. Slow down. Stop letting busyness distract you from what you need to deal with. Stop being so busy in the daytime and at night you're so tired that you're looking at porn or you don't have enough time for your children or whatever or, or whatever you're, you're dealing with. He's saying you have to face what's real and deal with it to, to get true freedom. He's like, you can't, you can't pray this away. You can't pray this away. You have to um, give it to God and let him work through it. But the thing about him working through it, he will need you to partner with him. Um, I've learned in my life that very very few things are a miracle. There there are um, things that are miracles, yes, that only God does, but usually he has you participate in your miracle. So, yes, you could pray about it, yes, you could get help, but the first step is you um, working with God to to participate in your miracle, to participate in your own healing, to participate in your own freedom. Because when you do that, you can say, yes, God did it, but he did it along with me. He did it along with me. It was a process. It was a journey. And remember I said before, freedom is a journey. It doesn't happen all at once. It does, but rarely does it happen all at once. It's a journey because if it's a journey, you, you'd be less likely to get back into it again. I think that's why God doesn't work miracles often is because he really, once you're free, he wants you to be free indeed. He doesn't want you to go back. He doesn't want half freedom and for you to have to go back and fight this again. And some stuff um, in your life, he will keep as a thorn to show how much you need him. And some stuff he you'll participate in your own freedom, like I said, and some stuff he'll just do for you because he's God like that. And what what one of those he chooses depends on his plan and depends on how he works through you and in you and how he wants you to minister to other people. Because some of the stuff you're going through is not for you. It's for, it's for other people that you're called to minister to. And it's for, um, it's for a testimony of his grace and of his glory. And um, he just wants me to say to you, that freedom is available, but you've got to stop running and embrace what's wrong so you can go, go towards what's right and you can go towards freedom. It is possible. It is 
it is possible. He, he just wants you to submit yourself to him. Remember I said like last week, I think it was, he doesn't want your sin. He wants yourself. He wants all of you, everything in your life. And he wants you to live free, totally. Because the Bible says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. So I I don't know about you, but I want that indeed freedom. And I'm believing in areas in my life that that indeed freedom is possible. Thank you, Lord. And just as a side note, um, there is someone out there who says, am I going through this because I did something wrong? Because I did... Um, d did this wrong? Is there anything in my life that I did wrong? And the Lord wants me to say, no, there isn't. Sometimes life is just life. I was talking to someone this morning about this, and as they were speaking, I was thinking that it's just life. Sometimes things happen for the glory of God. Sometimes Times things happen because it's just life. And um, it does say in the Bible, um, uh, the parent eats sour grapes and the children's teeth is set on edge. But, but keep in mind that that was before the cross. When the cross came, when Eve sinned, all this bad stuff started happening. So they had to, to get bullocks and goats and all that stuff to sacrifice. And that's when that was said. But under the new covenant, um, it was said um, that uh, when Jesus... Uh, came when Jesus was talking, I think it was to the p paralytic man, and said, who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus said, nobody sinned. This is for my glory. Um, so I just want to say that sometimes the bad stuff you go through is just life. And sometimes it's for the glory of God, depending on what he wants to do in your life. You are not cursed. It is not you. Sometimes it is just like life. And, and read the truth of the word of God. Don't take any stupid people's opinion about, oh, you're... you're your child is sick, you must have done something. No, the, the word of God said that all have sinned and fallen short. And sometimes life just happens. So hang tough. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you, Lord, for your truth. And thank you, Lord, for being reconciled to us and having us reconciled to you. I praise you. I lift you up and give you praise and glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.
So, guys, I will see you next week. Take care. In the name, in the name of our God. In the name, in the name of our God. Mountains be removed. Change shall be lived. In the name, in the name of our God. In the name. In the name of our God, in the name, in the name of our God, mountains be moved, chains shall be loosed. In the name, in the name of our God, in the name, in the name of our God. In the name, in the name of our God, mountains be moved, change shall be lived. In the name, in the name of our God, in the name, in the name of our God, in the name, in the name. Mountains be moved, change shall be lived. In the name, in the name of our God. That's what happens in the name of God. Chains are broken, people are loose, people are set free. People are not damned to hell or people are not cursed in the name of God. People are loose and set free. And when people are grieving, saints, please be careful what you say. Uh, when people have joyful situations, don't, don't dampen their joy with your negative things. We try to be people's personal Holy Spirit too much. And we try and judge people too much. But remember, with one finger pointing at them, there will be three fingers pointing at you if you judge them. The Lord hasn't called us to judge. He's called us to love. I'll, I'll say that again. The Lord hasn't called us to judge. He's called us to love. Or the Lord hasn't called us to judge harshly. He's called us to love greatly. So let us practice that as Christians. And when we don't understand something, leave it alone. Like, don't try and um, gloss over or have something for somebody's pain. Just be there and just um, let them know that you're there. You don't have to preach a sermon every time that somebody tells you something. Just be there for them. Hold them. Hug them. Tell them everything will be alright. Tell them you're praying for them and when you tell them you are praying for them. Actually do it. The church has been criticized with being too judgmental. And I understand that correction is necessary. Um, but I think correction is only valuable if you're close to that person. If you know that Correction comes through relationship. Now, if you don't have a relationship with that person, please don't try and correct them. And if you do, and if the Lord um, deems it so, then you can lovingly correct them. And before you correct 
anyone ask the Lord how to do it. Ask the Lord which which way to use and what what ter what terms to 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 use because you don't want to alienate people from the church, especially if they don't know the Lord. Too many people have have tried to correct people and they've run them and they've run them off from the church. Let's be a beacon of light, not Satan's darkness. This world is so so full of heartache and pain. People need love most of all. And love is and a lot of people think love is weak. No, honey, love is strong. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love does not expose people's sin. When I think of uh, Lot and what his sons did, his sons covered um, nakedness. His sons walked backwards so nobody would see their father's ugliness, their father's nakedness. But we tend to expose people's nakedness uh, and sometimes even have glee with it. Let's not do that. Let us love people. Let us embrace people. Let us show people that that Christ is truly love. Let us not speak the name of Jesus and then treat people like they don't matter or treat people like they're dust under our shoe. Because in, in the eyes of the Lord, we're all the same. We are all the same. We are all worthy of love. We are all struggling with something. We all have a certain Satan nature, we all have a God nature, and we all fight through it every day. Some of us, we have a visible fight, and some of us in, invisible. But we're all fighting with something every day. We're all, some of us are fighting with lust, some of us are fighting with gossip, some of us are fighting with food addiction, some of us are fighting with our children and learning how to get along. Some of us are fighting with so many things. You don't know what that person is fighting with. I challenge you, instead of judging them or, or saying all these comments, smile at them. Give them a word of encouragement to lighten their day. You have no idea what just a smile could do, what just a word of encouragement, what just a Facebook picture could do. Or something wonderful to, to encourage them and inspire them. It could change their whole life. One positive word can change somebody's whole life. And let us not forget that we are ambassadors of Christ, which means wherever we go, we represent Christ. An ambassador of a country represents Christ. And let us rec represent Christ and his truth and reconciliation. And let us remember that um, therefore the grace of God go I. Meaning that if given the same circumstances of that person, you might be in the same situation. So let us pray for each other and lift up each other let us not gossip about each other and pull down each other.
and let us not be so hungry for news and gossip that we forget that behind every story, behind every tabloid piece, there is a living and breathing person behind that. All these people in the tabloids, all these people that you see getting arrested, all these people that you see um, doing things, they are people. And yes, if you do something wrong, you deserve to be uh, reprimanded and you deserve to be dealt with accordingly, but you are still a person and you deserve grace just like I do. And let us remember that. Let us remember that the ultimate truth in reconciliation is not for one. It's for us all. He did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And it's so funny because, like, when he said he didn't come to call the righteous, um, I'm thinking there is none righteous. So he didn't, he came to call, call us sinners to repentance. So if you're interested, if you heard this sermon and are interested in, in um, knowing the Lord or getting into relationship with the Lord, um, just let him know and tell him all what's in your heart. Um, the, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you, sh you shall be saved. I, that is true, but I've had the experiences that even if you don't believe in your heart, if you confess with the, your mouth that, Lord, I think some what she's saying is for me. I can feel something in there. I'm not really sure. Please help me. That works too. Just an acknowledgement that you need help and you need him. It's all you need. You don't even need... <laughs> I'm of the opinion that you don't need to be sure that he exists. You just need to say, Lord, like, if you're, you just need to tell him what's in your heart. If you feel that little tug inside you, tell him what's in your heart. Even if you're not sure you're not, you're there yet, just tell him what's in your heart. And he will change your life forever. And you won't even recognize the person you are. He will radically change your life for the better. And all, all he needs you to do is say yes. Even if you don't fully believe or understand, just say yes, and trust me, your life will be changed forever. And if you need help after you are done pouring your heart out to the Lord, contact me and I'll be happy to help you. See you next week. In the name, in the name of our God. In the name, in the name of our God. Mountains be moved, change shall be lived. In the name, in the name of our God.